Go back to pre-iPhone, only three years ago. Phones were sold in truly walled gardens. What's so hard for people to remember, and this is good, I think, mm -hmm. go back to pre-iPhone, only three years ago. There was no app market for apps on phones. Phones were sold in truly walled gardens, as you know. You railed against this. And uh, the thought that a developer could make an app for a phone was, was un unheard of. Well, there were apps for the oh. Palm platform. There were some. Palm yeah. didn't operate a store, you're right. Yes. But there were apps and there were a few handfuls, yes. Companies would sell them and you could download there them. There were a few handfuls, but there wasn't anything. I mean, there no, was nothing like this. Even a percent of what there is now. Right. It's huge now. Okay. And, and also, when you bought a phone, the carrier dictated what was on that phone. Right. iPhone was the first phone where we had a new relationship with a carrier that said, carrier you worry about the network will worry about what's on the phone we found a way to sell the phone that we wanted to sell and define it the way we wanted to define it have the control that we wanted to have over what was on the phone versus the carrier controlling that so we were able to change the rules of the game and that's what got us excited about getting into the phone business and when you were talking about it here you didn't know that you could do that no right? absolutely didn't think we could We'd had some discussions and we didn't think we could. But we were able to persuade AT&T and they took a very big leap on us. I mean, we'd never been in the handset business before. We'd never been in the phone business in any way, shape or form. So they took a big leap on us and decided they were gonna trust us to do the right thing on the phone. And, uh, and it's worked out very well. So we were able to change the rules of those games in, in the game in the same way in the tablet. Yeah, talk about What I remember telling you on the tablet was, that handwriting was probably the slowest input method ever invented and that it, it, it was doomed to failure. Well, what we tried to do was reimagine the tablet. In other words, I think Microsoft did a lot of interesting work on the tablet. What we've done is not compete with what they did. We reimagined it and what we're doing is completely different than what they did. You know, they're completely stylus based. They're tablet PC that they have now. For 10 years. Yeah, right. What we said at the very beginning was, if you need a stylus, you've already failed. That drove everything. Their tablet PC was based on a PC. Right. Had all the expense of a PC, had the battery life of a PC, had the weight of a PC. It used a PC operating system that really needed the precision of the tip of an arrow of a cursor. Right. Well, the minute you throw a stylus out, you cannot get that precision. You have the precision of a finger, which is much cruder. Therefore, you need to have totally different software. So you can't use a PC operating system. And you have to bite the bullet and say, we're gonna to have to create this from scratch because all the PC apps won't work without being rewritten anyway. And so we built a very different animal. So when you built this OS, this multi-touch gestural OS for fingers, you didn't do it in a tablet right away, you did it in the phone. What was the, uh, I mean, did you consider doing a tablet when you did the iPhone or, or was it just a natural progression? The iPhone came out, it was a big hit. I'll actually tell you kind of a secret. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I actually started on the tablet first. Really? And uh, I had this idea of being able to get rid of the keyboard, type on a multi-touch glass display. And I asked our folks, could we come up with a multi-touch display that I could, we could type on, I could rest my hands on and actually type on. And about six months later, they called me in and showed me this prototype display. And it was amazing. And I gave it to one of our guys. This was in the early 90s. I mean, early, uh, early 2000s. 2000s. And uh, I gave it to one of our other really brilliant uh, UI folks. And he called me back a few weeks later and he had inertial scrolling working and a few other things. Now we were thinking about building a phone at that time. And when I saw the rubber band inertial scrolling and a few of the other things, I thought, oh my God, we can build a phone out of this. 
and I put the tablet project on the shelf because the phone was more important. And we went and took the next several years and did the iPhone. So and then and when we got our when we got our wind back and uh, thought we could take on something next, pulled the tablet off the shelf, took everything we learned from the phone, and went back to work on the tablet. I guess why wouldn't they be is the question. You could say when I'm going to write that 35-page uh, analyst report, uh, you know, I want to use my Bluetooth keyboard, but uh, that's one percent of the time I'm using it. So I still get the benefits the other 99 percent of the time. If you would say, well, the software is not powerful enough, that's just a matter of time. So it can't be that the software is not powerful enough because that can get fixed over time. So I think your vision would have to be fairly short to say that these things can't, over time, grow into uh, tools that can do many things. Such as, give us an example of what you would imagine would be something. Um, well, obviously the productivity stuff, but you know, uh, things like uh, editing video, things like uh, graphic arts, uh, things like music. Uh, you can imagine all of these content creation things on such devices. Does some of that depend on more powerful processors and so forth? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, time, ca time takes care of lots of this stuff. Do you imagine it being more flexible? Do you see yourself putting out an iPad that is not a hard glass surface? We don't have the technology to do that, and it, it's not on the horizon. I'm not an expert in what it takes to make flexible displays, but uh, a lot of people have tried, a lot of people are trying, and maybe somebody will have a breakthrough, but um, uh, flexible, printable uh, displays are probably the... Pretty bad. Many years away. One of the keys to Apple is Apple's an incredibly collaborative company. I have one of the best jobs in the world. I'm incredibly lucky. I thank all of our customers and employees for letting me do what I do. I get to come into work every morning to hang around some of the most wonderful, brightest, committed people I've ever met in my life. And together we get to play in the best sandbox I've ever seen and try to build great products for people. People are not spending their time searching. They're not doing searching anywhere near as much as they do on PCs. We've got all the data. We know this. They're spending their time in apps. So for whatever reason, if people want to find out that restaurant to go to, they're not going to their search engine typing in Japanese in Palo Alto. They're going to Yelp or whatever other app they want to go to to find out if their airplane's on time or this or that or this or that. Right. I don't know why it's different than on PCs. I think I do, but I'm not sure. I think it's because there never was one place with 200,000 apps where a ton of them were free and the rest of them were really inexpensive for PCs. I think this app thing's an entirely new phenomenon in, in my lifetime, in your lifetime. So I think people are using apps, well, we know they are using apps way more than they're using search. So if you want to make developers money, you put ads in the apps. Right. The ads and apps now are banners, right. and you touch them, and what is the first thing they do? They take you to a web page. Yeah, they rip you out of your app, send you to the browser, and all of a sudden, if you're not interested in that ad, you've got to figure out a way back to your app. And even if you can do that, you've got to figure out, in some cases, how to get back to the exact place in your app. If you're playing a game, you're probably not going to make it back to the same place. So wouldn't it be great if mobile ads didn't take you out of the app, but rather took over the screen, gave you this great experience of an interactive ad, but also combining the emotion of television with video, and any time you wanted, you could hit a little button, it takes you right back to where you left off, right where you left off in your app. People would explore those. And you apps. don't have faith that anyone else can do it. Sure, but nobody else is doing it. And so we could build it into the OS so the apps don't have to do it. We can make it so that an app developer can add these interactive ads in their apps with 30 minutes worth of work. 
versus working with every advertiser to do some custom thing in their app, which is crazy. And because we own, we own the OS, so we can put it right in the, in the bowels of the system. Could somebody else figure out a way to do that? Maybe they could, but they weren't, so we did. But then I sat back and said to myself, I invented a motherfucker. I actually sat back when I was fat.